computer. Okay, I think the recording is done. First, uh, okay, let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Armstrong's research interests. So her research concerns the application of statistics to genomics, in particular in statistical genetics, epigenetics, and genomic data integration. So now let us welcome her talk about genome-wide association studies and beyond. Thank you, Tao, and thank you for the invitation to speak at ANU. Um, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they will have seen that I, I tweeted yesterday that one thing that I miss about not being able to travel is the plane time, which allows me to prepare my talks uninterrupted. Um, I also want to apologize a little bit that this isn't really a very statistical talk. Um, as usual, I um, accepted the invitation to speak, thinking that I, the deadline would be good for my research and that I would get some stuff done. But um, for those of you that are, uh, might be in the know, um, this has been a fun year at Murdoch and um, it's not been a great week um, announcement wise. So um, today I wanted to talk about genome wide associations and beyond. And um, it's a story that actually starts um, with one of the first GWAS that I ever performed almost 10 years ago now. Um, and we just got it published this year. It was a long involved story, um, which I'll give you a little bit of a background about. Um, and we're still interested in going on because yes, we've got genome wide significant hits, yay. We got it published in a, in a good journal, but we still don't know what the underlying genetics is, what the underlying story is. And so we're looking now at what other data we have available and also how we can use the data that we do have to try and tease out what is actually going on to cause the phenotypes that we're interested in. Oh, uh, okay. I think I just have to click, I'll go down here. Okay, so um, I know that I'm speaking to a statistical audience. So I started off um, basic with um, DNA markers that we might be interested in. And DNA markers are just, you know, we typically we view the genome as being a long line, um, which is wrong, but it's easy to visualize it as a big long line. And a DNA marker is literally just a landmark along that line. And we, um, it can be a polymorphism at a known location, could be a microsatellite marker, which is what I started out dealing with when I first started in genetics many years ago, which are simple tandem repeats of two, three or four nucleotides. Um, in the genome, oh, go back. Um, and then we got went up and we went um, in more detail and we were able to get single nucleotide po polymorphisms, which is just single, single base substitution. So here I've got an example, this person one is a C and a G in their genome at this particular location, whereas another person is a T and an A. So this is a SNP, um, which allows us to, to potentially differentiate between people, but also allows us, obviously, when looking to find out um, what the differences are between people who have a particular um, phenotype or physical characteristic or disease and those that don't have that particular physical um, characteristic or disease. Um, and obviously we want to look to see if there are differences between those that do and those that don't. And if we have um, cases versus controls, disease versus healthy, then obviously we then can end up doing pretty much a chi-squared test at every single one of our locations in the genome our markers. And um, back in the olden days before we went um, genome wide that we would only maybe have 100, 200, 300 markers. And now of course we've got um, the whole genome sequenced. So we've got millions of markers. If we have a phenotype that is not um, case control zero one, um, we have a quantitative phenotype um, and then we're looking to find um, we're looking to find fitting a linear model basically in um, where yi is my phenotype of person i and um, xij will be their SNP uh, genotype for person i at location j um, and obviously there will be j of, uh, up to j of these models which you know is um, hundreds of thousands to millions of these models um, and we're looking to find if there's a, an association between someone's genotype at a particular locus and, and their phenotype characteristic. We might include covariates such as age and sex, um, but we're still only looking um, at searching through this space SNP 
by SNP um, most of the time. And we're also only treating a SNP as being um, having two alleles. And we're looking at treating the, the SNP as being, um, we're looking at counting the number of copies of one of those alleles. So we would code this X variable as being zero, one or two, depending on some, whether someone had zero of whatever we're determining the reference allele to be, one copy of the reference allele or two copies of the reference allele. And then obviously we're looking at whether or not the B is significant or not. So these assumptions obviously are the, um, that we're making when we're doing this sort of um, search is that um, there's a linear association between the genotype um, and the phenotype. Sometimes we're also now look, not just looking at a genotype, but this um, XIJ might be the expression or the methylation value of a particular locus or gene. And we're trying to relate that also to the phenotype. Um, this is genetics. If we have expression, then we might be looking at EQTLs. And if we're looking at methylation, that's, um, I think it's MQTLs now they call them. And for the genetic model, we could be changing how we're coding our SNP to change it from an additive model to dominant or recessive by coding, um, recoding um, how we're treating that X variable. So in reality, we only ever use the additive model um, unless information from biology is pointing us to a different model. We generally, when we're running a, a, an association analysis or study, we only are using the additive model. We never look at an additive model and a dominant model and a recessive model. And we're always assuming um, linearity as well. So once upon a time, um, way back um, when I first returned to Australia, um, I got involved with the Sydney Memory and Aging Study uh, run out of UNSW, and we have about a thousand participants there who were genotyped on arrays. And we were interested in um, this phenotype called white matter hyperintensities. Um, and in particular, we were interested in the regional delineation between where these white matter hyperintensities occur in your brain. So um, here's MRI scans of the brain, and the white matter hyperintensities are, of course, um, these white areas that show up on an MRI. And they can occur, and don't ask me really to delineate, this slide was given to me. These are what they call periventricular white matter lesions, and these are deep white matter lesions. So where these white spots in your brain occur um, is um, of interest um, in the clinic. Why? because these guys are strongly associated with cognitive functional impairments and are correlated with um, dementias, basically. We know that they have a strong genetic basis, but they are quite different. In, um, and so therefore different genetic factors may also be involved. And when we've looked at heritability studies, that has indicated that there are um, different heritability coefficients for deep and periventricular white matter hyperintensities, which seems to indicate that they are not the same phenotype. So there's a publication out of the um, UNSW team that says um, that they're under strong genetic influence and that the heritability is high for total and for periventricular and for deep, and obviously varies depending on where you're looking in the brain. So when you run a um, genome-wide association analysis, you're basically fitting these um, linear models to every single DNA marker that you have. And when you've got single nucleotide, um, single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs, you have a lot of markers. So on the AFI array, I think we ended up with about 700 or 800,000 markers that had passed um, quality control filters. And so what we do is we plot a Manhattan plot and we plot for each position on the chromosome, we plot the minus log 10 of the p-value. And obviously the larger, um, the, P the smaller the p-value, the larger the LOD score is, and so the higher it will be. And um, we view traditionally that a p-value of less than 5 times 10 to the minus 8, so above this line would be genome-wide statistically significant, and if it's above 10 to the minus 5, then it is suggestive significant. Interestingly enough, those... Um, thresholds have not changed, even though the number of SNPs that we're looking at has increased a lot. 
So um, in 2012, um, you know, we didn't find anything just looking at mass because 1,000 people is um, not, um, not a large sample size nowadays in genetics or genomics. So we then looked in 2012, we had the Australian, older Australian twin study, and we got them genotyped as well. But, um, you know, this is the real world. So obviously the Affymetrics chips were on the way out and Illumina was the way to go. So we used um, genotyping arrays from Illumina, um, which meant that we had a different set of SNPs, a lot of overlap, but some difference. And we looked at using the oats samples to replicate the mass genome-wide significant SNPs and we didn't replicate anything. But how were we able to use the Illumina genotyping SNPs to replicate the mass ones when they're on different arrays? We looked at uh, imputing the data. And so this um, lovely um, diagram I got from one of the imputation um, software package websites, um, we have cases and controls or our individuals are typed on some genotyping chip. Um, and obviously there will be missing genotypes and there will be some markers that are on the AFI chip that are not on the Illumina chip and vice versa. So what we do is we um, have a reference haplotype um, coming from the Thousand Genomes Project or HapMap or UK Biobank now. Um, there's the Haplotype Reference Consortium and there's also um, TopMed can be used now as an imputation panel. Um, and you basically are trying to infer um, on the basis of this reference panel, what the missing genotypes should be in your population. Um, and of course, there are many different ways you can do that. And there are many different programs that you can um, use to do that. And Impute2 is one of them. So what that means though, is that I might've only had three quarters of a million SNPs on my actual um, genotyping chip. But when I impute up to um, thousand genomes or HapMap or the Haplotype Reference Consortium, et cetera, now, I might end up with 20 million SNPs. So we're, we're going up another couple of magnitudes in terms of the data that we have. And of course, each of those um, SNPs has a quality measure as in how accurately the program thinks it has been um, imputed. And now instead of having a zero, one or two, we have what we call a dosage score, which will um, be continuous between zero and two, but obviously with um, density mass at zero, one and two representing the, um, the, two, the three possible um, additive genotypes. Making sense? I hope so. Um, so we got somewhere, we didn't get somewhere with just looking at mass and we were unable to replicate anything in oats and also obviously we looked the other way around as well. So what can we do? We can combine um, our two data sets together. So we do a, a meta-analysis. So we're trying to increase our sample size and therefore increase our power. Um, there's two approaches that are common in um, GUR's literature, combining p-values using FIS's approach um, and combining the effects. So this is a fixed effects model with um, inverse variance weighting. And this is happily enough that the one that is most often used and it's the one obviously that we used and again, there's a really nice software package that you can use to combine um, and to perform meta-analyses because of course you're doing it for every single SNP that the two data sets have in common. So it's again, large data analysis. So in 2013 and 14, we meta-analyzed mass and oats together and we imputed um, both studies to the 1000 Genomes Reference Panel. And we got some significant genome-wide significance hits and we were like, yay. So the next thing to do is um, to replicate. You can't publish anymore if you just have genome-wide significant um, hits in one study or one meta-analysis. You have to replicate in an independent um, study. So we asked um, some people in France um, that have a study called 3C Dijon to replicate for us and fell down again and we weren't able to replicate. So that meant we had to aim even bigger than what we had done. And so in 2015-16, we um, formed an international um, collaboration I, um, with Karen Mather at UNSW and Paul Nyquist, um, who's a neurologist at Johns Hopkins. 
and we went to um, Enigma and Charge um, that we are members of and we um, put out um, a call for people who were interested in looking at deep and periventricular um, delineations and had genetics and the phenotypes that we were interested in. So it's um, unfortunate that um, no matter what people say about open data, access, et cetera, genetics doesn't fit into that, um, that little um, open access field. Um, we pretty much, it's hard to get um, people to share the raw genetic data. So we have to do a meta-analysis. So um, we have to recruit cohorts with both our, the phenotypes that we're interested in and genetic data on those individuals. And we need to draw up an analysis plan that the contributing cohorts are able to follow. And that means that we all have to just determine what the precise phenotype that we're interested in is and what covariates that they have available that we think so that everyone's doing their analysis on their cohort exactly the same. And we also have to be aware of the fact that each of these contributing cohorts might not necessarily have an analyst, as we are called, to run the analysis for us. So um, it has to be using standard software that they can um, do quite simply and easily. And sometimes we have to wait a few months to get the um, results sent back to us. So we get a summary of their results. So this is our analysis plan, probably not very interesting for statisticians. Um, but we, we try to incorporate as much as possible and exclude people um, that are, have had a stroke because that can affect um, the white matter hyperintensity um, in your brain and also if you've already got dementia and we weren't interested in including you. And these um, phenotypes uh, generally occur later in life. Um, and so people had to be over the age of 45 because people under the age of 30, say, or even 40, don't often have white matter hyperintensities. Um, so there's no point in including them. We found a lot of cohorts um, that had volumetric data so that the white matter hyperintensities um, had been delineated using the MRI scans, um, both from European backgrounds and for, from African-American backgrounds. And we also had um, about 4,000 or just under 4,000 individuals that had um, white matter hyperintensities scored using um, an index called the Fasikas index or score, um, rather than a quantitative measure of white matter hyperintensity. So their um, phenotype was, uh, I think, between zero and ten, maybe say, um, and we treated that as is it was continuous. Um, QC again is uh, standard. Um, and there's a really nice package called EasyQC that you go through and you've got to QC each cohort individually from their summary statistics and then before you combine them. And um, when I talk about here, all lambdas being less than 1.1, lambda is what we call the genomic inflation um, factor. Yeah, um, and that's the ratio of the median of our empirically observed test statistics divided by the median of what we would expect um, if there was no association. Um, and so basically it's telling us when we do a QQ plot of our p-values or our test statistics, sorry, we expect it to be on the straight diagonal line and the more deviation we get from that, then um, the higher the lambda will be. And um, we would like our lambdas to be less than 1.1. So we carried out a meta-analysis and we found lots of, um, lots of these um, Manhattan plots and we saw that we were getting a big peak on chromosome 17 for deep and for peri, but we had some that were coming up to be marginally significant um, for periventricular in particular. This chromosome 17 locus had already been found for total white matter hyperintensities um, as opposed to the regional delineations. So then we needed a um, independent um, replication or validation set. And at the end of 2017, we were lucky to get advanced access to some of the UK Biobank um, data um, in a collaboration with Stephen Smith from Oxford there. Um, and so we got data from about eight and a half thousand UK Biobank subjects 
and we were able to um, validate or replicate some of our findings. But of course, then why not combine the UK biobank samples with the original discovery meta-analysis um, since there was 8,000 of them and we had about 18,000 total. Um, so we did that. And then when you don't have a Manhattan plot, you can do a Miami plot. And the Miami plot um, has um, the periventricular guys at the top and the deep um, white matter hyperintensity um, p-values down the bottom. So it's sort of a reflection in the water, I guess, is why it's a, a Miami plot instead of my Manhattan plot. And you can see that we have massive um, hits on the chromosome 17 region, but we also have quite a few now genome-wide significant hits in periventricular that we're not seeing in deep. And that leads us, thankfully, to conclude that we were right, that there is stuff going on in peri that differentiates it from deep. But we're obviously really interested in in what's going on in this chromosome 17 region, which is a really gene rich region. So how can we go further and try and figure out what's going on in the chromosome 17 region, but also um, how related or unrelated these um, two phenotypes are and how they might be related to other similar um, diseases. Okay, so let's skip those. That's my chromosome 17 region that I'm really interested in. You can see that there's a lot of genes um, in that region. So we're interested in how we can um, attempt to understand the differences between the underlying genetics of deep and periventricular white matter hyperintensities. Um, and so there is a whole series of um, downstream analyses that you can do. Remember that the only thing that I have from each of my individual cohorts um, is the p-value, the effect size, and the number of subjects. Basically, that's my summary statistics, and that's what I've used in my meta-analysis to come up with, obviously, an overall set of um, coefficient estimates, p-values, and, and the n for each individual SNP. And those um, results are also available. Um, you can get access to them through um, different databases for other um, GWAS that have been done with different phenotypes. So there are a few methods that have been created in the last two or three years for downstream analysis. And this GWAS PW is one of them, where if you've got two different phenotypes, um, it could be that um, you have what we call model one, where there is a causal SNP um, for phenotype one in this region of the genome, but not for phenotype two. So it could be the reverse, um, or it could be that there is um, a causal SNP for both phenotypes in that region, and it's the same SNP, or it's a different SNP. Um, and we cannot differentiate between model three and model four. What these guys have done using statistics is they've come up with um, a method that will calculate the posterior probability of um, of being of having um, this situation or that situation or model three situation at any um, region in the genome. So what they did was obviously they've um, blocked out the genome into different blocks um, using linkage disequilibrium, which I might have a slide on in a minute if people don't know what that is, probably not. Um, and you can end up, you, you get these scores that you can then look and see whether or not um, there are regions where um, the two phenotypes might be related or overlap, because that's what we're looking at. And so for, for deep and peri white matter hyperintensities, we can look and see whether or not there's overlap between um, different regions and whether or not someone's had a stroke, what type of stroke they've had. So this is all stroke, ischemic stroke and um, small vessel disease. Um, and maybe there's overlap between the two um, phenotypes. And this would also, if, if I was only gonna get, um, so PPA is the posterior probability for model three and we should be looking at this apparently being bigger than 0.9. So we have this. Um, we're looking at um, trying to see if there's more differences between deep and periventricular. 
And so if they're overlapping or if there's strength of um, genetic overlap with other phenotypes that are different between the two, then that's also indicating that they are not the same disease and that there is different underlying things going on to give you white matter hyperintensities in the deep versus the peri regions of the brain. Here's my slide for linkage disequilibrium. If I have a chromosome, we expect um, if you've got yeah, two lines, two things right next to each other, they will be associated with each other just because um, they are being inherited um, from one generation to the next more likely together. And so if, if you've got a causal SNP and you've got a SNP right next to it, the SNP right next to it will um, be associated with the causal SNP but it will not be the causal SNP itself. So when we look at linkage disequilibrium patterns, you can see here um, that some of my SNPs are located next to each other and they are inherited together. Um, and sometimes there's a big distance between SNPs on the physical chromosome, but they are still seem to be co-inherited um, together. Um, So that's something that we have to take into account. Um, and that's what LD score regression does, which is another um, method that we can use to look at um, whether or not we've got two traits. So LD score regression will take the test scores from a genome-wide association study and will um, do a regression of your test statistics on the the score of linkage disequilibrium at each of those loci. And the intercept from this regression is also an estimate of the genomic inflation factor. And if I have two traits that I'm interested in, so for instance, periventricular and deep white matter hyperintensities, um, and I fit the same model for the test statistics on the LD score, then the slope of this line is a measure of the correlation between the two traits. Um, so I can do that obviously for deep white matter hyperintensities with my different types of stroke and for my periventricular with my different types of stroke and I can get my estimates of my slope and you can see that they're all fairly similar. There might be some differences with low bar, probably not. Um, and of course I've got large standard errors but nothing really came out of my LD score regression. Um, okay. Let me just talk about that. So one thing that we were interested in then is if there's any other variation in the genome that we can take into account because um, since we started on this project, we had our first mass um, guys genotyped with the AFI array. We then had our oats guys genotyped, shouldn't say guys, people, um, genotyped with the um, Illumina arrays. Um, but we've also, um, since then, we've also got whole genome sequencing on a smaller, much smaller number of um, participants from mass and oats. And the people that we um, targeted for the next whole genome sequencing, of course, also had um, MRI data. So now we can look at um, not just whether or not um, we've got SNPs, but we can also look at whether or not we have short tandem repeats, STRs. And that is um, positions in the genome going back right to where I first started off, almost microsatellite markers, right? Where we'll have this short tandem repeat and someone has this CTA repeated five times, someone else might have it six times and someone else might have it seven times or 20 times. Um, and so that is another marker that we can use. And we also know that these short tandem repeats can be um, disease causing. So that the big one there that people might be aware of is Huntington's disease that has a particular repeat pattern. And if you have more than, I think it's 50 or 55 of this, um, I can't remember how many, um, what the, the tag is for it, but if you have that repeated more than 50 times or 55 times as a threshold and over that, you start to um, physically manifest with um, having Huntington's disease. So some people will sit at 40, um, 
of these of, of report peats of the Huntington's allele and not get Huntington's disease. So if you have more than there's, there's a threshold over which you get the disease. Um, and there are other, um, a lot of the ataxias also have these short tandem repeats that if they are above a threshold, then you, um, it manifests itself it, um, with nasty things going wrong. So um, there are of course many different types of these short tandem repeats um, and we can find them in our reference genome by an algorithm. And so here's one of them, tandem repeat finder. And of course this algorithm, any algorithm to find words that are repeated um, can be tweaked for the motif size that you're looking at and the sensitivity and the specificity at which you want to pick up these motifs. Uh, more than 44 of these known repeats that cause disease. Um, and the majority of these are annotated from short, uh, from sh annotated short tandem repeats may not be from an annotated short tandem repeat. So, and there are of course de novo repeat expansions where this short tandem repeat is not annotated and it's not been identified as an expansion anywhere so far. So um, how do we find these short tandem repeats? So here's some of the detection um, algorithms that we have looked at. Um, Gangster, Expansion Hunter, Expansion Hunter de novo, Extra, Tread Pass, and stretch. Um, gangster, you give it a bed file, um, which will assess. So we'll be looking for STRs in 830,000 um, different genomic locations. Um, and it takes a while to run. Um, Expansion Hunter um, and Extra are only looking at known sets of um, annotated STRs. Expansion Hunter de novo is looking for de novo, so unidentified um, repeat expansions. Um, and there the repeat has to be more than the length of um, the read. So Illumina sequencing is 150 base pairs or letters. And so Expansion Hunter de novo will find um, expansions or short tandem repeats that are more than 150 base pairs in length. And when I was writing up this talk, I was sitting there thinking, oh, there's an awful lot that we have to do still to determine how confident we are in that our STRs have been called and that our num allele numbers or our repeat numbers for each um, STR is correct. But this morning I was reflecting on it and I was thinking, well, no, actually, because actually, even when we did the genotyping using the SNP arrays, there is a lot of um, background stuff that we don't think about anymore when we get our genotype calls from the arrays. Because the array of course gives us a, an expression intensity um, and then that has to be um, clustered and determined to be that, you know, if your expression intensity, if your uh, red and green allele intensities were, color intensities were, you know, 10 and 10, then you are going, they're gonna call you as being um, genotype A at that locus. And if it's 10 for one and 15 for the other, then maybe you'll be B and, and so on. But we don't think about that anymore um, because I guess the technology and the methods are all bedded down and fairly stable now. STRs, we're not bedded down and we're not stable yet, but we do have to think about um, how trustworthy our data is. Because what we get out of many of these algorithms is we get, um, a combination of the reference and alternative alleles. So gangster, which is what I want to talk about, gives me that I've got eight repeats of the reference allele and three repeats of the alternative allele. And that's what I get out for each of these um, STR loci, and I've got 832,000 of them. So it's sort of like I've got um, what I, the data that I had from my genotyping um, array, 800,000, but instead of just having zero, one or two of an allele, I'll have eight on one chromosome and three on the other, or I'll have five and five because um, these short tandem repeats are not biallelic. My SNPs that I'm looking at, that I've ever looked at, have all been biallelic, so there's only two alternatives. STRs, I've got many alternatives. 
So here's one um, STR that we were interested in. It's this CAG repeat in the androgen receptor gene, which um, is on the Y chromosome. Well, I don't know, maybe it's on the X chromosome, but we only look at it in males. I forget. Anyway, it's easy because we've only got one chromosome that we're interested in for the CAG repeat. And um, we can look, this is, I think I've got about 200 males here. Um, and I can look and see what the different copy numbers are. So this person, these people had, you know, 12 copies of this um, CAG repeat in that, um, at that position. And someone, some people have 31 or 32 copies of this CAG repeat. And what people have tended to do then is to um, split the, uh, the number of copy numbers into heart, short and long um, and then look. Because what I could do is I could look at the copy number of my um, CAG repeat. So how many of those repeats someone has and I can plot it against my phenotype of interest and I can see if there's a relationship. What people also do is split the alleles into long versus short and look at um, my phenotype of interest against, and here I put it against the expression of the antigen receptor gene and saw that the long guys have a different relationship to what the people with a short um, repeat expansion have. This is not statistically significant. You can look at the um, Y scale and see that it's probably not. It's very, very small, um, slight, and that's probably because I have very few people here because this was me just playing around. I had to have people with the whole genome sequencing and the MRI and also um, expression arrays on those same people and there was very few of them. But this is the sort of thing that was trying to find out, is this um, repeat expansion linked to anything um, in terms of the brain and in terms of antigen response? But you can see that we can do that for this guy because I only had one allele that I was interested in. And I then delineated it into long and short. And what was interesting was that the, the paper that I was copying this from, um, from collaborators, they were interested in this um, because it had, and they had said that the median was 22 and the median also, and we're looking at much younger, um, young adults. And in my very old males, um, the copy number medium was also still around 22. So I delineated into short and long also using the same number. Because these repeats can slip as you get older. So um, I then, we then took um, our data. We have about 500 whole genome sequencing, uh, individuals whole genome sequenced. And we ran um, Gangster on them and um, we're really interested in our chromosome 17 region, obviously. And so I started to plot um, what we're getting for our copy numbers for the first allele and the second allele. And we get some where, you know, there's a group that have one copy of this uh, repeat expansion at this locus and some people have six copies on both chromosomes. But most people have five. And the reference allele, I think, was five for this one. And there is some variation. These are obviously also different STRs in um, the chromosome 17 region. And so where I didn't get up to what I wanted to get up to um, is, of course, what I'm going to do with this data. Um, and that is still a work in progress. Um, but we can see that there, so in the chromosome 17 region that I was interested in, um, there were 210 um, short tandem repeats found. Um, or in the gangster database that I then got copy numbers for, um, for my 500 samples. And most of them show very little variation. So everyone is pretty much like this and there's nothing above or below. Um, or there's maybe just one person with, you know, instead of five, five, they've got five, six. And so I just, I have just removed them but of course, you don't know if that might be important or not, because of course, I don't know what I'm looking for. Most people, when they identify and are looking at these short tandem repeats still in the literature, they're looking at 
specific loci that are disease causing and they know a cutoff and they're, they're looking and they're saying, we know that if the, the STR is above this threshold or below this threshold, it's disease causing or not. I don't know any of that. I'm trying to, I want to treat my STRs as, as a genotype. So my main interest at the moment is how best I'm going to be able to analyze this type of data because I've got my whole um, international consortium running um, gangster on about 3000 um, whole genome samples. And I'm going to be getting that data and I have to figure out what the heck I'm going to do with it. So a tradition, a single STR may have any number of alleles, whereas traditionally we focused just on having these um, biallelic loci. So now I've got, I don't know how many alleles I'm going to have at each of my 800,000 loci. So what we could do and what is done actually, because STRs are also used in forensics um, to identify whether or not, you know, that person really is the, the um, perpetrator or not. They'll look at um, STRs um, at several regions that are known and they'll be using um, electrophoresis gels to determine the genotypes of um, the number of alleles or the repeats that each um, of the DNA samples have in, in trying to figure out what they're doing, or who it is. So they're comparing the frequencies of the different alleles at each locus. And we can do that between groups. If we've got cases and controls, the healthy, per, the healthy people versus the person that has um, something wrong with them and try and figure out if they've got similar or different numbers of um, repeats at each of those things. But what happens if we have a quantitative um, phenotype? So when we're comparing the frequencies of the different alleles at each locus, then we've got uh, up to 20 tests per locus um, of cases versus controls. But when we've got a quantitative phenotype, we can't group. We're gonna have, um, yeah, it, it might be different. Um, focus on STRs in a known gene or region is what else I found in the literature, but that's not hypothesis free because they already know that, that gene, they've already decided that that gene is linked um, to the disease. It's like me looking at the chromosome 17 region, that's already massively reduced the number of STRs that I want to look at, but that's not hypothesis free and it's certainly not genome wide. Um, and people then will look at the disease causing STRs have this known threshold above which we um, say that the disease is present. We don't have a known threshold. So I can't delineate into um, short versus long STRs um, because I don't know. And, and you can see that for some of my data, um, the, I've got a large variation in my number of elite copy numbers. Um, and in some, I don't have that much variation. And one thing that I don't know is, um, is this variation between one and six statistically significant or an artifact of the sequencing technology? Um, that's something else that I need to look into um, as well. Yeah. So there was one article that I found that was published at the end of last year. Um, and what they did was they took the um, average repeat length of the two alleles for each individual. So if someone has two copies of a repeat and 10 copies of a repeat, then that average repeat length will be six. So that person would have the same value as someone who was six and six. And I would hope that they would be different. So when you read on what they then said was that the repeat length is defined as the difference between what was observed and the, they used the HD19 reference um, repeat length, which was say five. So then if you were six, six, this becomes one, one. So the average is one, which is different than to two and 10, which becomes three and five or four. So um, that was a little bit better. And what they did then had for each STR was one continuous number and they regressed the phenotype on this repeat length. Um, and what was interesting was they used gene expression data from 17 tissues as the phenotypes and identified what they call expression STRs. So STRs that have an impact on um, the expression of a gene um, that is tissues, tissue specific. Um, and here's my, one of my um, copy numbers or alleles, STRs. And I go from this graph then to this graph in terms of the data that I have um, if I use their method and then they're using this data to um, link to the expression STRs. 
I'm almost out of time. Um, I stopped here partly because I then started going down the biological rabbit hole because when I look at their data, they in the chromosome 17 region, they actually have two brain regions, the chordate and the cerebellum and, um, and whole blood. And when I look at the chromosome 17 region and their, for their expression ET, ESTRs, TRIM65 comes up and that is one that is in my chromosome 17 region. Um, and interestingly, what comes up in the chordate is different to what comes up for the cerebellum apart from um, TRIM65 being in common. And they also have whole blood as one of their tissues and TRIM65 comes up in whole blood as well. So does FBF1, and which also comes up in the cerebellum, but not the chordate. So now on my weekly call with my Johns Hopkins collaborator tomorrow, I'm going to be asking him about the cerebellum and the chordate in respect to um, white matter hyperintensities. Um, and we're, yeah, so absolutely no statistics involved in that. It's me going off down um, the applied rabbit hole. And maybe we'll find something, maybe we won't. But what I would really like to do is to, um, yeah, figure out a way to analyze this STR data genome wide. The one thing that I haven't touched on is that actually dealing with um, this sort of data is what we did 20 years ago before we got SNP arrays and whole genome sequencing. And so there are methods for multi-allelic association testing in the literature from 20 years ago, which is also on my list to go back and go um, look at that stuff again and see if any of that can be used for the short tandem repeats genome-wide. Um, and probably um, if there is code out there, it will be probably very slow to scale up to the um, quantities of data that we have um, now. So that's the end of my ramblings. And I just wanna thank Paul and Karen and Morelli and Stephanie um, from the University of Bordeaux. And of course, all the cohort researchers and participants that uh, have willingly and unknowingly given us their data. Thank you. Let us thank uh, Professor Armstrong for her very interesting talk. So any questions or comments? Um, I have a lot, if that's OK. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot for a great talk, Nicola. I'm very happy to see more talks on uh, like the GWAS. Um, it is also my research interest as well. Um, so one of the things I was wondering, um, and maybe you have done this, um, is that um, a lot of times in GWAS, um, there might be some population structure in place. And so sometimes people will try to control for this. So I'm wondering whether um, that was done or like if you were to do it, like what do you reckon like is a, a like approach to the so all of our um, cohorts did their own individual QC. So they, uh, and a lot of them are members of Enigma and Enigma has great uh, genetic protocols. Um, so the um, eigenstrat has already been run and any genetic outliers in terms of ethnicity have been removed from the data. So that means that when I talk about my um, Caucasians, then I'm talking about ones that are um, linked together or, or sit closely together in those PCA multiple MDS plots. Um, when we looked at, um, we have a small number of Hispanics and a small number of African-Americans also from the American studies in the, in the um, meta-analysis. When I look at them separately, I don't have enough power. But when I look at what I get, when I just look at the Europeans or the Caucasians, and then I add in the African-Americans and the Hispanics, it doesn't change my sequence. <laughs> Mm. So um, we're thinking that the signals that we're getting, that the, 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 the hits that we're seeing are um, across the ethnicities that we have. Mm. What about like um, certain things like, um, because you may also have families. Um, within yeah, so we have the older Australian twin study. Okay. Yep. And so, so that analysis is, um, so each cohort does their own analysis. We're assuming that there's no genetic overlap between the cohorts. And that's probably pretty fair to say, um, to be honest, um, or that the amount of genetic um, kinship between individuals from different, uh, different cohorts would be very low. But yeah, so we, as always, you know, I've got one 
um, cohort of unrelated and one cohort of highly related. And I have to use different analysis methods to get my summary statistics on them. Mm. Yeah. Um, so and the summary statistics that are generated for each cohort takes into account the kinship that's present in each cohort. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if I, I, other people have questions, please interrupt me because I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> um, so the other thing I was wondering um, was that, um, so uh, when you introduced the, the GWAS, um, the model was such that you test one marker at a time. Mm -hmm. um, there's also another approach that um, in particular, I guess this comes from, and the where area that I'm interested uh, I worked on with GWAS was really was plants. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's different to human for sure. Um, and then so they tend to use what's called the whole genome approach. Um, and they consider not just having the marker at a time, but you sort of include like um, uh, the relation between the, um, the, the whole, uh, the individuals that you have um, by essentially fitting these um, relation as a random effects. Um, and so I don't know if, um, you know, um, because um, the Queensland Brains Institute, like Jian Yang, um, yep. now Ray, Peter Vischer, they've got the GCTA and they kind of yep. took that from the animal and plant breeding mm -hmm. and then put it in the human side of things. Mm -hmm. So you mean like, um, so which one from the GCTA? Which um, method? Well, so I assume, I don't know about the methodology so much, just like, I don't know, I don't use their things. Because so we did try their conditional and joint analysis, Kojo. Mm -hmm. And um, I was quite disappointed in that. Um, all that did um, was raise up my p-values in, in terms of LOD um, slightly, but didn't push anything over. Okay, so so from your view, so I'm a bit interested because I guess from the plant side of things, we kind of take the whole genome approach as sort of a standard. Um, so whether in human studies, people, I, I do see this more often that it is more about thinking markers, testing one at a time. Yep. And so it just, you reckon like it doesn't really make much of a difference whether you go either. Um, it didn't in my case. Um, if, if what you're talking about is, is um is um, Kojo, but I think when you're saying that they take into account the whole of genome, is, is that like just basically saying you've got, basically you, you're looking at a kinship matrix? Yeah, and you put and that. And including that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, no, so that, um, that is basically what I've done when I've done the older Australian twins study, um, because I have analyzed them taking into account their relatedness. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that has been done. For those cohorts where we know that the people are related, because of course, unlike plants where you, and especially plant studies, you know that, you know, they're all related. You're not going to take 50,000 plants from 50,000 different locations. So all of your plants is, are controlled, right? So you know the, the, you know the family structure, if you like, of plants, because plants are bred and animals are bred. Um, in controlled populations, right? Either inbred or outbred in an experimental study, you know this, the family structure of your animals or your plants. Humans, we don't, but we can estimate based on how similar someone's genome is to someone else's genome, we can uh, estimate um, their identity by descent or their identity by state and estimate how related they are. And we can use that um, in our analysis. And what I do when I analyze the older Australian twin study is I'm taking into account the fact that this person and this person are monozygotic twins or dizygotic twins or are siblings. Mm. So but in my, in my mass guys, I've already checked and my identity by um, state um, statistics for my mass shows that they're all unrelated. So I'm analyzing them as independent people. Okay, so you take two approaches. So I just got confused a bit because uh, when you showed the model in the beginning, um, yeah. I just had the impression it's just one at a time and the mark- The SNP are... is one at a time. Yeah. And um, that's the basic uh, one where I guess my uh, individuals are unrelated. Where my individuals are related, then that model is more complicated because I am taking into account the fact the relatedness. Yeah. Okay. But my meta-analysis is also assuming that all my individual cohorts are independent. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was like, so there was some of the visualization that you showed. Um, so I was wondering like, you know, um, uh, I mean, you, so that was the one that was, um, uh, what was it? If you go back in your slide, it had the, the two, two um, yeah, the long and short. That one? Uh, no, no. Um, so oh. there was a graph where you did a comparison. Yeah. yeah. So it was this one, I actually felt, um, I mean, you said that they are not statistically significant, um, no. but uh, part of it is, uh, I thought was this, it's, it's, it's a bit hard to compare it like this, um, in yeah. a sense that the scales are different between the two graphs as well. Um, and so, it, I don't know, I yeah. mean, I was wondering maybe there's a nicer way to, to actually represent this if you want to. Oh, do sure. That. This is quick and dirty graphs, titling. Mm. Yeah. And it turns out I was looking at um, periventricular and total white matter hyperintensities. And I shouldn't have been looking at white matter hyperintensities. I should have been looking at white matter volume because that's what um, Thomas did in his paper. So I shouldn't even have been looking at um, the lesion measures. Mm. This, this was me. Basically, I've got this new data set, if you like. What the heck am I going to do with it? And what was interesting was I um, looked at this for um, one of the consortia I'm part of because they were interested in this CA to re repeat in, um, in the AR um, gene. And um, it actually, Gangster comes with a set of um, repeats and the CAG repeat in the uh, androgen receptor gene, which is known and has been published on, is not in this set of repeats. So it was in the expansion hunter um, set that we looked at. So we got the, the numbers out from Expansion Hunter, but we didn't get it out from Gangster. So we had to go back and we had to add in and make sure that Gangster, when we run it, includes some of the known repeat elements that are not in how they got theirs. Sidetrack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, Amy, I, I have to interrupt. Uh, if, you, if you want to, yeah, if you want to chat with the speaker more, so I will, uh, after, at the end of this meeting, so I will leave the Zoom meeting open so you can chat with the speaker more about it. Uh, so do you, uh, uh, are, are there any other um, audiences who want to uh, ask a question or give a comment? Okay, okay, uh, so, Okay, let us thank uh, Professor Armstrong again for her very interesting talk. And thank you all for joining this seminar today. And next week, we are going to have a Zoom seminar at 9 a.m. because the speaker is at New Zealand. So the notification has been sent. So please take care and stay well and safe and see you next week. So now I'm going to stop uh, recording and feel free to chat with the speakers.